Hello, and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 308th New Social Environment. I'm Malvika Jolly, Special Projects Associate here at The Rail, and today I have the pleasure and privilege of welcoming Pakistani-American sculptor Huma Baba, who will be in conversation with rail art historical duo Amanda Gleevisi and Jason Rosenfeld. We're also so lucky to have the writer Daisy Atterbury here with us today, who will read to close today's program. Finally, we've started out all of our events here with two important acknowledgements. The first is that here in New York, we're on Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wabinger, Kanarsi, Munsi, and Lenni Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and the Shinnecock Indian Nation. The second is an acknowledgement that Black Lives Matter. And uh, I do think it's worth um, taking a moment to remember that the heart of both of these acknowledgements is a commitment to the liberation of the oppressed and solidarity for all of those who struggle for freedom. In that spirit, I encourage you to check out the chat where I'll post in just a moment a living document of resources and actions that we're putting together at the rail uh, as we do our part in undoing and addressing these legacies. Um, but now it's uh, my honor to welcome our wonderful guests for the afternoon. Huma Baba's work is populated by themes of memory, war, displacement, and the pervasive histories of colonial rule. Using found materials and the detritus of everyday life, she creates haunting human figures that hover between abstraction and figuration, monumentalism and entropy. entropy. So sorry. Uh, while her formal vocabulary is very much her own, she embraces a postmodern hybridity that spans centuries and the limits of geography, art historical traditions, and cultural associations. Um, keeping us in conversation today is uh, our Amanda Gleevisi, art historian and founding director of the New Foundation for Art History and art scene editor for the Brooklyn Rail. Um, along with her is Jason Rosenfeld, curator and distinguished chair and professor of art history at Marymount Manhattan College. Jason Rosenfeld is a senior writer and editor at large for the Brooklyn Rail. Amanda and Jason, take it away. Thanks, Malvika. Thank you, Malvika. And um, thank you also to the great team at the rail, as usual, for helping to put all this together, including the usual suspects, Malvika and Jess and Nick, and of course, Fong, and also to the folks at Salon 94 who have been uh, indispensable, um, Nicholas Okart, Okart and Ross uh, Goddick, and also uh, Ms. Greenberg, who runs everything. Um, so thank you all. These guys are terrific. And made it a pleasure to get this together today. And thank you, Uma, for joining us live from Poughkeepsie. I'm coming at you from the West Village today on this Memorial Day springboard holiday rail new social environment event. We'd like to recognize the um, veterans in the audience and in all of your families and acknowledge those who have died for the country uh, per Memorial Day, the official holiday and uh, turn over to Amanda for the moment to, to get us started. Okay, Jason, are you gonna share the slide chat? Oh, yeah, the awesome. share in the slide does come up right now. <laughs> Great. Full, there we go. Okay. So we're talking with Huma Baba today um, and looking at quite a bit of her more recent work. Um, there is a really, really wonderfully comprehensive interview with her that was published in The Rail in 2018. And I know that Malvika will put that into the chat as a link. Um, so we really wanted to focus on things that you may have seen recently or that you can see right now. So right now we're looking at this monumental installation. Um, we Come in Peace from 2018 that was on the roof of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And you see two figures facing off. And then Jason, let's uh, move to see other install images. But I couldn't resist <laughs> putting this in here because we're talking today with the, who I, who I consider is the greatest uh, pop sci-fi science fiction fan in all of Poughkeepsie easily, Huma, <laughs> um, and the connections with movies like The Day the Earth Stood Still from 1951, which is the kind of film now that our kids will laugh at because of the um, the special effects, uh, because it you know it looks ridiculous, but had a great impact on uh, audiences in the post-war era um, and you know going forward, and of course on filmmakers, and there's a real homage to these kinds of sci-fi films, which we will bring in repeatedly over the course of the talk. And that was very striking in this uh, extraordinary confluence of two figures that uh, Huma installed on the roof of the Met in 2018. 
And then we just wanted to plug a couple other uh, shows now that you can go to to see a great collection of um, Huma's works. Uh, in addition to, I think at Petzl Gallery in Chelsea, there's a work or two in a group show that they have on right now, but also up at the Bronx Museum of the Arts, which is close enough from Malvika to walk to from her house. Um, there is a, a brilliant show, which I have not seen yet, but has just opened and it's on through September, so no excuses. Born in Flames, an exploration of feminist futures. And we're seeing a view of a, a gallery installation view here with some of Huma's works in the foreground. Um, this like like Zenobia Bailey, but I'm not sure. Um, I haven't been up there yet. And then here's another view where you see a whole room of Huma's works from the from 2019 to 2020. So a little survey of recent uh, objects, and also it's um, it's meant to be a, a great show and and really important. Uh, Jasmine Way, he is the curator, and then uh, of course right now on East 89th Street, just off of the Central Park, um, and just uh, across from the Guggenheim is a fantastic show, which we'll be looking at in detail, uh, whom is show Facing Giants, um, which is up through June 26, 2021, in the former um, sort of overflow exhibition galleries of the National Academy of Design, which Raphael Vignoli has brilliantly uh, reworked into these, I mean, impossibly beautiful galleries and a, a generous amount of space. I encourage everyone to go up there and see what's going on. It is really extraordinary. Of course, you should schedule an appointment, be ready to have your temperature taken, that whole thing. Um, but you see Huma's works, uh, new works, and that's up through June. So we're gonna be talking about that a bit today. And the first room in that exhibit includes works like this. Go ahead, Amanda. Yeah, so Huma, these are some of the first of your collages that I've seen in person. Um, I, of course, was aware of them from reading about them, but I hadn't actually encountered them in life before. And I was really struck, first of all, by how large everything was, although perhaps I shouldn't have been, and also by the way you're collaging these elements. So um, this was one of my favorites uh, from the show. It has uh, zebras kind of collaged into the face. So could you speak to us a little bit about um, what is your process here and, and why is the, the two-dimensional collage important for you as a sculptor? I, um, before I started making sculpture, and this is going back a long time, um, I was a two-dimensional artist and it was only after graduate school that I um, started to make um, three-dimensional work and then realized that that's what I should be doing. Um, and then I went back to drawing and I don't usually draw for my sculpture. I make drawing separately, but I started drawing um, and I used to do portraits when I was in high school. And uh, so I was pretty good at that. So I went back to drawing uh, faces and feet and figures. Um, and when I started doing them as, at, in the same room at the same time as the sculpture, so they would be, when something was drying, I would go and do a little bit of drawing. And then, uh, then I would take a break from that and go back to the sculpture. And then I started to notice um, there was a lot of um, uh, back and forth between the two ways of working, which was uh, helpful to me and uh, beneficial for the work. And then the more, the more I started doing it, the, I, I'm a strong believer in the more you do something, the better you become at it. And I think that, um, you know, so I, I think I've become better at it. And I started using, I've always used collage uh, since I was in art school. Uh, so, using uh, images cut out of magazines or invitations from other people's art shows or, um, you know, and then I started and I had this wildlife calendar uh, once the year had passed. So it was just, you know, obviously not of any use as a calendar, but uh, I started using that uh, just images from pages from the calendars. And then uh, I was, very uh, into uh, wolves. Um, I'm, I'm, 
I'm a romantic. So after visiting the uh, wolf sanctuary, I uh, felt very um, connected to them. And so I did a lot of, uh, you know, and my, my husband gave me a wolf calendar as a present when he came to visit me in Berlin. So it was, you know, also material, it was a material to use. Mm -hmm. um, we don't usually exchange many presents, but things like that is good. <laughs> useful and uh, initially you know I, I realized that they looked uh, great you know as as collage material and something to start with and um, then I just uh, you know kept uh, you know they allow me to be expressionistic and intuitive and uh, whimsical funny you know they're quite funny I think and it's a combination of uh, you know the animals which in, I like seeing them in the and then um, sort of combining them with these sort of demonic uh, uh, portraits which I which come to me very naturally so I um, I guess it uh, sort of reflects an anxiety of the ongoing uh, destruction of uh, wildlife and the ecosystem so what, anyway I want to ask you about that because I, I we read that you know, you worked in a taxidermy studio in the Hudson Valley, and you spoke about when you were younger going to the market at Karachi in Pakistan and being fascinated by how they used to carve up animals at the butchers there. Um, is this a kind of pushback against those earlier experiences of animals and flesh and uh, display? No. Um... Visiting the butcher shop, uh, you know, I mean, when you go to India or Pakistan, the meat is not sold necessarily packaged and it hasn't been slaughtered like, you know, several days before. It's done that day. So actually it's much better. Um, and it's a natural thing, you know, and, um, and also like, you know, I mean, uh, we have a, a holiday, uh, which is, um, it's a religious holiday and it's based on the um, slaughter of, uh, you know, either cows or goats. Uh, it's supposed to um, uh, make up for, I think it was uh, Abraham was supposed to sacrifice mm -hmm. his son, but then a goat appeared, you know. So the yep. idea is you sacrifice something that's dear to you or that you spent a lot of money buying, which it is now. Uh, but anyway, uh, th those, I mean, I grew up with those kind of things. Uh, going to the market to watch the butcher was just fascinating because um, the meat is cut by hand mm -hmm. and it is beautifully done. Like the, they know they don't just use a, a bandsaw, you know, like they do. And, uh, it's just a different sort of, uh, so I, I used to just, because the market used to be open, so there would be cats running around and dogs and, and then, so it would freak people out, I guess. Uh, and we should note that Uma is, a, is an animal lover and has, is the proud owner of three golden labs. Um, no, uh, two labs and a corgi. So. Oh, two, it's a corgi, the new one. Ah, I didn't realize that. So, uh, the my, dog of royalty. <laughs> Um, Let's show this one. Here. So these were not a reaction to anything like that. They, yeah. I, I barely think about those things in that way. Hmm. Uh, the taxidermy job was uh, um, very, in, you know, informative for my work. Uh, I realized it gradually. I learned how to make armatures and um, hmm. with different materials the way they do, and uh, um, so it helped me. Um, even though I did have, uh, um, there was a lot of, uh, you know, dead animals and skin and stuff like that mm -hmm. lying around. It smelled kind of bad. <laughs> like an abattoir. <laughs> what, what was the biggest animal that you had to work on in taxidermy? taxidermy. Well, I didn't do, actually do the taxidermy. I was, All right. uh, because I mean, you need a lot more experience for that. And I yeah. wasn't interested in, I mean, I, I just took the job because, when I moved to the Hudson Valley, uh, you know, it's very difficult to get a, it's not like being in New York City. Mm. Um, so there are no jobs really that are interesting in that way. And when I went to uh, interview for the job, uh, 
it was a beautiful setting and he had horses. He has horses, he has peacocks and golden pheasants and he had dogs running around. And so I was like, oh great, I'll just do this because, uh, so I had to actually um, sculpt noses and ears and eyes that get damaged in the uh, tanning process. Mm. Um, and then uh, paint a little bit. Uh, even though my boss used to do all the airbrushing, but I, uh, you know, watched him and I did all the others. Yeah. So the largest animal I think was a giraffe. Whoa. And they did, um, and also elk, I think. Yeah. You know. Amazing. Those are huge. Well, from huge animals to really cute animals. <laughs> the, the baby <laughs> cheetahs in this one. This amazing work, which is such a, a amalgamation of that you know, sort of awe, cute uh, calendar of wildlife. And then this super creepy, bald-headed, um, pointed-eared uh, creature, which, as you say, is something that's innate to you <laughs> in making these things. But we were looking for some sort of, looking for some reference points. You can, everyone can see the little che the cheetah here and the, the cheetah there above, and they're really fluffy when they're small. It's a family. I saw some, yeah, there's family. They're really beautiful. I saw some when I was there's in South Africa. Them, yeah. Yeah, they're so cute. And I was thinking about precedents for this kind of demonic figure and everybody's covered it from Michelangelo and this great image of Charon, the boat, boat, uh, the, the boatman on the river Styx, which I never understood why he was in an image of the last judgment, but that's okay. Michelangelo could get away with these things. Um, he has a sort of similar features. And then of course, you know, things like this again, Baptist, pop sci-fi the creature from the black lagoon who was much scarier in the movie than in film stills like this one i was i was thinking about nosferatu but um, yeah nosferatu too yeah I, I forgot to get a picture of that nosferatu. somebody in the somebody in the chat though also says that the national Enquirer is bat boy yeah the bat boy there's a lot we could do with this image and of course the nosferatu and Werner herzog's great film which is the greatest movies ever um, but these like sort of lurking characters and you, you refer to them as portraits? This is portraiture. Okay, and so in what sense? I mean, I, I see them as, uh, as, you know, in the tradition of portraiture. Yeah. Um, yes, I mean, I, I look at a lot of, uh, you know, th this kind of imagery. I, I was actually also very influenced by, um, um, you know, artists like uh, Anselm Kiefer and Arnold Reiner drawing mm -hmm. over either their own photographs or other photographs and um, sort of like disfiguring things uh, in a way. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, that also drew me to uh, use, to draw, to take my own photographs and draw on them, um, which you don't have any in the, slideshow, but there are some in the show. Um, upstairs, right? In that gallery yeah. upstairs. Yeah. And I started that actually with, because I did um, uh, um, an edition of uh, photogravures uh, in 2007. And um, I had I had done printmaking in, uh, when I was in, at RISD and so I was familiar with the process and uh, I liked the idea of using the photo gravure image rather than just doing straight etching. Mm. And um, so for that I had taken photographs of landscape, uh, preferably landscape without any, uh, you know, real architecture. It's usually just like foundations of uh, buildings that are, uh, that are unfinished and using the idea was to think of the, the those as plinths within the barren landscape to draw monumental uh, figures and, and monuments or gigantic giants and maybe remnants of them, for example, just their feet uh, because maybe they were broken. Um, and then that led to using you know, other kinds of collage and drawing on uh, larger photographs. The initial, the first ones were black and white and then I started using color. And so each thing makes it more complicated and 
uh, more things to think about and how to uh, transform them. Huma, I wanted to ask you um, about the, the collages. If we are familiar with your practice, which I assume most of us are, it's also kind of a collage or a bricolage sort of practice where you're putting together different materials in order to, to form your sculptures. So how is it different for you working in two dimensions versus three dimensions? I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's fine for me <laughs> to move back and forth between them. Uh, I think a lot of uh, sculptors, um, you know, do uh, amazing drawings. And I think maybe it's because of working with different materials that your sort of um, approach to the drawing is, uh, you know, is quite natural. Uh, and then to go back and forth. Uh, and as I said earlier, sometimes they inform each other. And I also draw on the sculpture. Mm -hmm. So that I think comes a lot from the mark making on the drawings. Mm -hmm. So that, um, be because I don't make drawings for the sculpture. Right. right. Um, it's interesting the way you're talking about plinths and just looking at the view here of the ground floor installation at Salon 94, because of course plinths are an essential feature in the display of these works, uh, even if they're very low and on the ground. But the way that you're talking about using architectural renderings in your flat work as plinths for portraits and heads and figures, uh, it, uh, but they're not, as you say, they're not studies for anything else, but the plinth as a platform. And, and I know the way you talked about um, the roof project at the Met, that the roof was a kind of stage and it feels like that's an important element in the way you're thinking about the work, how it's presented. Yes, I've always, uh, for a long time, I've thought about uh, the, you know, when installing a show, it's an opportunity to stage a recreation of uh, imaginary events, you know, and that could be anything, I guess, you know, it just depends. Each space offers you a different opportunity. And my first show at uh, ATM, gallery in 2004, um, it was a tiny gallery, which was just a East Village, you know, there's a front store, front space, and then there's another room and then another room, like a railroad, you know, apartment. I used to live in a railroad apartment. So, um, yeah. so but I, again, um, it's how you, and, and also I've always uh, wanted a lot of space and show maybe just a few things. Uh, because the more space you have, at least with my work, I feel um, it has an opportunity to expand itself um, quite a bit. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, with the new uh, Salon 94 space, um, I saw it from when it was first being uh, sort of the demo was happening and then um, eventually the rooms were being exposed and how beautiful they were. And the ceilings are like in this room, I think the ceilings are around 13 feet, something like that. And then the second floor is 20 feet. And yeah. my, after doing the rooftop, the Met roof, um, uh, I think it was the following year. And I mean, I knew I wasn't gonna do a show for a while, but I had already decided that uh, I wanted to make smaller works. I mean, that was the only time I made works of that scale. I never, I don't work on uh, such a large scale normally. But, uh, and it was interesting because this is an incredible space and um, it allows you to think in, about it in many different ways. And, uh, but the smaller, the I thought that maybe I would not, at first I thought maybe I wouldn't have enough work. Then I thought I had too much work. And it was all once we started to install, uh, I ended up putting everything that I had sent to the gallery. And, uh, but I uh, was amazed that, you know, uh, you, you, I mean, uh, the sculptures are quite small, but they don't, you, you can't put anything else in that room. You know, it was just uh, enough, you know. Yeah, and I should note that we're looking at it from the rear, so you actually enter through these grand doors here, uh, so that uh, they're all kind of facing you when you come in. We're seeing it here from the back with the whole image. Except for the little white. Uh, yeah, this guy. One, you this see one. the back of that sculpture. 
and yeah, that one's um, totally right. it's interesting. And I wanted it to um, sort of look uh, because there is a rawness to the space, even though it's very finished in some ways. And then the sculptures are very raw also. Mm. And um, in the essay by Danielle Shang, uh, she actually understood what I was talking when, when we talked about the installation. And she uh, writes that, you know, it, um, it's almost like you're walking into, um, into a room, uh, into a sort of a room of a museum or an archaeological museum where there are, uh, everything has just been excavated, but then it's just placed and you're basically there to examine everything, you know. So it has that sort of feeling like it's not um, so museum-like or anything, but it's uh, kind of like in between. Yeah. I'm going to look at a couple of works in this room, starting with, go ahead, Amanda, this one, mm -hmm. Pathfinder. Yeah, I was really, really uh, just fascinated by Pathfinder and then the other sculpture that's somewhat small and was kind of next to it that also has bones in it. Um, this was, you know, something that I became very, very aware of looking both at your collages and then also at these sculptures that there is an interest in the organic. Um, Obviously, you're already using cork and things like that, but here we actually see materials that could theoretically decay at some point and decay in a natural way as opposed to like, you know, like styrofoam falling apart in an unnatural way. I was really curious too because they seem to be able to be seen from the front and the back. They're, they're, there's a duality to them. And so I was really curious about the way that you're thinking about your installations and how the sculptures work together. Are they confronting each other? Are they in conversation with each other? How do you determine how far apart to place them? How close to place them? So I was just curious about, about how you approach your installations. I, um, I think that this was the first time that there was a little model <laughs> that I could uh, actually uh, play with the little um, with little miniatures of the sculptures, um, and uh, I had made certain decisions. Uh, if you go up to the to the second floor, where I have the big bronze, which is receiver, uh, that was actually used in a photo shoot for the uh, video of the gallery, and so I realized that I'll just leave it there. I mean, that's where it should be. And um, then for the, the, uh, the second floor is all bronzes. I mean, obviously you have to, I'm quite practical in certain ways. You know, I, you have to sort of make certain decisions based on practicality. And so I didn't want to make my life difficult and move things around up and down. Uh, so the bronzes are heavy and they're, you know, so they were all going to go um, upstairs and then this room is basically all mixed media. So there's something different in each of them. And even the central one uh, is a bronze, but it's just one bronze there. And then, then there's a cork with bones and cork with um, shells and then styrofoam. And then um, the, there are two in this room which are also new ideas, um, which are basically plaster, cork, you know, paint. So I wanted this room to be um, sort of almost like an artifact room, you know. Uh, but they, um, except they do all kind of look at each other, but uh, I think that's natural because you sort of, you want to walk through and I wanted to give enough space so that you can walk around each sculpture because just like we do, um, they have fronts and backs and different uh, anatomical features that I wanted to show. And um, so that's why you have to go back. And, and then so they could be talking to each other. The two little ones are almost like sentinels that are standing in the back before you go up into the other spaces. And then um, the others are sort of looking at you, trying to converse with you um attract your attention i mean i like to think about it that way that they are sort of uh, in a theatrical setting 
it, it really struck me when I was seeing this show that um, all of the work that I've seen of yours, it's always been in concert with other works of yours. I, I was realizing I've never only seen one of your works. And what was interesting to me about that is that then I have memories of installations, but not necessarily of single pieces. Uh, you know, like the whole makes this impression on me rather than a one piece. And so I was just really, really fascinated by this idea of, of the artist using the installation as, as a medium here. Yes, I mean, if you have the opportunity, I think it's very important to think about. I mean, I like to think about pedestals also. So it's not something that is just, uh, every little thing is thought about, you know. I mean, whether it's apparent or not, it's, um, it's these are kind of what I, things I think about. <laughs> so, um, and um, obviously when you have shows in different spaces, uh, sometimes it's, and I was grateful that mine wasn't like the, I wasn't the first person to show in the new spaces uh, because it's, you know, it's too new. You need to know the, I have done that before, but um, mm. this was a, this is a big space and um, it was good to see other work in it, to see how that um, mm -hmm. uh, was installed, how it looked and how much room uh, it needed. And, you know, so that gave me uh, more confidence in the way I was thinking about my installation. I think also very striking to me in looking at these works is that they're, they're, they're very vertically thrusting. Um, you know, they, they are already bodily because they are in a sense bodies, but they reflect the verticality of our standing bodies. And I put this comparison together. I mean, it's yeah, I thought a little that bit was, off. That's funny. <laughs> Yeah, but this idea that you talk a lot about uh, growing up in Karachi, how it's a very uh, horizontal city, how there's some, been some really hideous third world pop-up architecture that's being built there, but the most of it is sort of spread out. And I think when I saw the work on the roof of the Met, um, that standing figure you know, made total sense surrounded by the, the skyscrapers of Manhattan, which keep getting taller and taller and taller. The city's sort of gone up 35% in the last 10 years, the standard height. And it feels like so many of these are in, in some way a kind of subtle response to, to architecture. They have an architectural quality. Yes, uh, there is definitely, um, you know, I, I work in a formal way and um, the formal sort of associations uh, within the sculptures provide a way for, um, or they function as a device to articulate notions of monumentality, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, there's definitely, um, there's the architectural uh, element and then there's the sort of sculptural element that uh, mm -hmm. uh, they, they're both combined. And in some of the earlier mixed media pieces where I use styrofoam, in a way where it is stacked. And even in the cork uh, sculpture, the um, cork layers of cork are stacked one on top of each other, the way ancient monuments, they did that with stone, and then the surface is carved or the mm. exterior is carved into a form. So I, I, I definitely uh, think about, um, I mean, I don't know how an architect would feel, but <laughs> for me, uh, the combination of these materials and also the way that they are uh, sort of uh, carved after they've been assembled uh, feels architectural to me. So they, and yeah. they do, even my earlier pieces, uh, I always, I saw them as um, sort of walking architectural uh, monuments with a kind of a skin of clay uh, as the surface, as the outside, so. Mm. That's Architects are often really interesting when, they, when you see them draw people with respect to their um, works. And I look at the way that you kind of draw these, these bodies or, or add pastel acrylic onto the surface of the cork to make these bodies. It has that kind of angularity, which I think of Corbusier's drawings and sculptures of, of people, of humans that are part of his, that are part of his works. It has that kind of quality. They're very, um, they are quite architectural. Go ahead, Amanda. 
Um, Huma, you mentioned something about how you, you choose to put anatomical features onto your sculptures. And this was um, something that I was really curious about. The sculptures that we're seeing in this show and, and others of your work, but especially the stuff that we're talking about right now is very obviously gendered. Um, they, there are vaginas, there are penises, there are testicles, there are breasts. And so I was curious about this. Um, how, how do you know what gender your sculptures are? How do they tell you? Uh, I mean, as you just said, they are both, you know. So, I mean, they, they're not necessarily, um, I mean, I don't see them necessarily. I guess this one is a female, you know, but then again, it could be uh, different. I mean, I don't, I don't sort of put genders on them. It's just um, how I feel uh, they had, they should be able to sort of, you know, have both uh, notions, I mean, both genders there. And like with the predator that you just showed, I mean, we don't know whether yeah, sure. it's a male or a female, you know. <laughs> and again, it's, uh, there are so many things happening just in the face, which are uh, referred to gender, you know. So I'm that kind of is sort of fascinating to me, you know, where um, I mean, I don't know if you I was always very influenced by a lot of um, sci fi and horror movies where, again, there is that um, there's this movie by David Cronenberg. I think it's called Rabbit. Uh, I don't know if you've seen it. And it's all about the vagina being in the armpit. And it's actually mm. like, a, you know, um, it's like that flower, you know, the, that, what's it called? The one that eats the- uh, The Venus thing. fly trap. Yes. Mm -hmm. So mm. there's, uh, you know, there's something, uh, yeah. So, so I'm, I mean, I'm thinking about things like that when I'm deciding, you know, how to um, approach the gender of, but they are not, I mean, I, would say a lot of them right now are female, but it depends. Depends, and sometimes the faces have, I mean, here that people, uh, I think the essay writer described her, uh, this figure as having Princess Leia uh, buns uh, hair on its sides, but the face also has a kind of direct crudeness, which makes it, like you say, with the Predator films, impossible to determine a kind of gender um, you know, despite the evident breasts and vagina and pink and et cetera, all these kinds of things. Mm -hmm. they're, they're, sli they're, they're slippery on purpose. I, I guess that's the imaginative and humorous part of so much of these works. Well, it's nice. I mean, I think it's, for me, it's good to, um, you know, leave, a, sort of create a implied narrative, but then, uh, the relationship between the artwork and the viewer has to be, uh, they have to, it's a challenge for them to sort of, you know, come up with uh, your own sort of uh, uh, relationships within the work, yeah. you know, and mm -hmm. rather than, because I'm not basing them on real people or uh, specific times or events or, um, so that's why I think, um, there's just enough information in my mind so that it still makes it very, I hope it does, interesting to the viewer to imagine them in different uh, places or different times, you know, or what their function is to them or their relationship to them. Right. And with a work like this, Huma, when you make it, you're, you're forming it out of the material, almost like a maquette, but on scale, and then making a, um, a cast from that to cast the bronze, right? And what happens to the maquette, to the large scale um, work that you made in it advance? It survives. It's, uh, it you know, it gets um, a little bit damaged and, um, but mm. um, it, it does survive at times. It depends, uh, you know, some, some of them don't because of the interior structure, but right. um, it, it gets pretty ravaged. Because when yeah. they when they pull the mold out, you know, so the surfaces are compromised. Yeah, 
Uh, there is an uh, everyone should go see these because there is an alchemical wizardry in the way that the concrete is made to look like any material. Uh, it's hard to go and see it and and you mean the and, bronze? Yeah, I'm sorry, not the concrete. Yeah, excuse me, bronze. Yeah, because it it it's trompe l'oeil. It fools your eye into thinking you're looking at cork. And and unfortunately, you want to touch all of it. I really feel like you want to you want to touch all of it. So it, it inspires a kind of haptic haptic quality. You really want to feel it. But um, it's it's pretty mind blowing the way the cork resembles uh, the bronze cork uh, back and forth. They're really beautiful in that way. Yes, it's uh, that's one of the things that I I mean I think when I made my first bronze, uh, I think it was two thousand and seven, and I really love uh, the materials that I use, you know, like uh, the found objects, uh, you know, mm. garbage, um, you know, pieces of styrofoam, uh, uh, any, all, all those kind of materials. I have a, a very strong relationship with them. And I initially thought that, well, you know, it's all about those materials, but then of course the, lore of bronze is very strong also. So when one was able to start making them, you know, the fact that the foundry, um, uh, they pay so much attention to every detail. And then you can make it uh, like the Giacometti that you have on the screen right now is all bronze and it's uh, one patina. But yeah. then the one, my one on the left is a painted bronze. So basically it has been, um, every mark that you see there was there on the original sculpture, whether it's a smudge uh, or just a very fine, um, you know, dusting of paint on top of it. So. Uh, uh, so it, it, it transfers or you're replicating it from the. From it's replicated. The, I it's, see. It's uh, painted on, yes. Yeah, and then, bronze uh, has come uh, a long way, Huma. Bronze has come a long way since Giacometti in the 1930s and the 1950s. I mean, you're playing with it, or, or you're you're experimenting with it and working with it in a way that's uh, really he's remarkable. Still, uh, he's still, you know, the person that you go back to. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's that's uh, right. there's a you know different kind of uh, understanding there that uh, one can yeah. learn from each time. Yeah, yeah. He's a wizard, formal wizard, extraordinary. So. Um, I wanted to show, uh, we wanted to show one last work from downstairs, which is this work called Amy. My mysteriously, I don't know what that reference is. I'm hoping you might enlighten us. And I was at the Metropolitan Museum yesterday looking at Alice Neal again, and I walked past this work, which is on loan from Cologne to the Assyrian galleries, the nation, ancient Near East galleries. And it just struck me as, you know, the, the Hittites, the Neo Hittites were thinking about what you would be doing in 2020, 2021, with these incredible closed outline, compact, very heavy, uh, heavily restored, obviously sculpture on the left, really extraordinary work and something that, you know, we don't have very much of in this country, these kinds of pieces, but maybe talk to us please a little bit about Amy, which is such a striking work there on the right. Yes, Amy was uh, sort of one of the you know, like when I just said earlier that I wanted to start making works uh, on a smaller scale for this upcoming show, but this was a couple of years ago when I started thinking about it. And this is one of the first pieces that I started with uh, to think of the size and this idea of, um, uh, I mean, uh, I uh, one of the questions uh, from Amanda was that, you know, um, why did I title it Amy and that it has a name rather than a title? Um, mm -hmm. I title the sculptures and I see, I see Amy as a title, not as a name, but I have uh, titled other sculptures with, uh, you know, human names, I mean, or, or you know, names of people. And um, sometimes it's, you know, uh, just to sort of uh, differentiate them from other sculptures but also uh, yeah, I'm paying homage to somebody. And in this case, uh, you know, it's uh, named after Amy Goodman and she is a long time, um, you know, I thought about her as a very heroic person. So that was why I wanted to just call it, I mean, you know, this is my, 
sort of homage to her. Mm. And uh, this piece, um, I'm, I, I was interested when you uh, paired it with the Hittite uh, piece, which also, if you look in uh, Aztec sculpture, they have very similar seated box-like compacted uh, uh, sculptures. And I, um, so Amy has like this uh, sort of, it's votive and it's sublime. It has a certain amount of anxiety which I think a lot of the work has. Um, and I have been, have been thinking about that. I mean, I guess these are sort of things that you uh, have from a long time ago. And um, I wanted, there's also a certain amount of mystery, which as I mentioned before, it's like I like you to think about the sculpture for whatever reasons you want to think about it. Mm -hmm. um, with these smaller pieces, uh, she, Amy has hands on two sides and then it's, it's multi-limbed and um, it's cut on, it's made on the angle. So yeah. it's slightly different from some of the other works, uh, the cork works. And um, it definitely, uh, for me, it's, uh, I wanted to give this, most of the pieces in the show, they had this idea of being like your household god um, right. that you have, uh, you develop a familiarity with that, you know, and uh, you can share everything. And then the, the, they have like your own personal deity. Mm. And uh, this, uh, and, and I guess um, I did a few other pieces also, but they feel like, you know, they're really holding their breath inside, you know. So it has all these kind of emotional, physical qualities, you know. The household God, the household God is what you take with you when the house is on fire, like Aeneas fleeing Troy <laughs> with the household gods, always <laughs> think of that. This is the thing you grab and take it out the door with you. It's quite light. Get... <laughs> it's light. <laughs> you can actually yeah. carry it, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's light, it's cork, right? It also has a kind of determination, which if we want to resist portraiture or not, but marries with Amy Goodman's approach to, you know, what she does in a sense. Mm -hmm. It feels like it has a kind of directness and determination mm -hmm. and it's very beautiful. The color is just beautiful. Um, and it's monumental, uh, it's small work, but it has a kind of It's sort of like presence. a, I mean, I, I guess I, I could also describe it as a counter monument, you know. Yeah, yeah. All, yeah. The, all the works in the show are sort of like yeah. that. Uh, counter monumental, counter. Right. Kuma, where, how, how do you think it will age? Which one? Amy. I mean, it's cork and styrofoam. And, you know, unlike a household god, which would have been made of fired clay or would have been made of stone, so it would have hopefully been durable. So if you did take it when Rome was burning, it would stay with you. Um, this theoretically could decay and fall apart. So how do you think it will look in 50 years? Like the piece on the left. <laughs> yeah, if the if the Assyrians. Well, I don't get their think it will uh, decay uh, by itself. I mean, if you leave anything out in the sun, um, you know, the natural elements can erode uh, anything. But um, styrofoam is extremely durable. I have a couple yeah. of sculptures that I've had for years. Uh, nothing happens to them. I yeah, mean, it's interesting. They have it's to be uh, kept inside and treated like yeah. art. Like Tara Donovan's work, you know, Tara Donovan uses all kinds of materials um, that seem ephemeral, but in fact, the plastics that she uses will last for hundreds of years. So collectors need not fear that they are dealing with conservation nightmares. Um, these things are, are more durable, I think. Uh, than I, think I think maybe though different, different conservation yeah. nightmares, right? Like Tara Donovan's right. work could yellow. Um, yeah. This styrofoam could get like pilly or something like that, you know, or maybe it could actually like get a little sweaty, which would be fascinating mm -hmm. if we're thinking about, um, for example, African gods who are dressed in ablutions, right? They're dressed in oils so that they're, mm -hmm. they're, they're celebrated in that way. And even if you go to the Met, you can see some of them are dripping oil onto their plinths. 
Well, like uh, the the Pali sculptures, they have you know uh, bodily fluids and excrement rubbed on them, like dung, you know, and mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. so and they're very old. And I mean, you have the right sort of uh, material holding all these uh, different uh, together, like you know the. So I I don't think um, it, it's just about how things are treated you know like the Hittite sculpture has obviously has gone through a lot of uh, uh, forced damage you know right otherwise it couldn't be this way you know mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. yeah when you go to Berlin and you go to the museum island and you see the bullet holes all over the place you know uh, yeah. they've left them there so that it's nice to be reminded of that yeah yeah just one more work from downstairs and then we'll go upstairs as we, we're we gonna wrap up in about 15 minutes or so. But we love this one, Soft Touch, um, which is this extraordinary head-like form on a narrow neck. And then you come around the back and it's got this gaping hole um, in on the, on the rear, uh, which you can kind of look into a bit. It's made out of, again, the similar materials, wood and plaster. And it reminded us of geodes uh, I had a grandfather who made geodes in the basement um, and these kinds of open orifices. G.E. Schwartz notes that it's there's a, a kind of a similarity to Francis Bacon's works, those sort of mouths which he was obsessed with throughout his career. And then just to be a little more fun, of course, The Empire Strikes Back and the space slug that uh, the Millennium Falcon has to escape from in the greatest movie of the series. Thought about that when I was seeing this thing, but I think that this sort of extremely curious object uh, for me sort of encapsulates that whole idea of humor and imagination and unpretentiousness, which is which you've described as being part of how you sort of approach your work. Yes, and I mean, it's like a gigantic eye at the same time, you know? Yeah or the eye that swallows you. Um, mm. But uh, yeah, these were, uh, these are new pieces and I have starting to make a few more like this. And mm -hmm. what was really um, fun to do was to actually paint them. And um, so I, you know, basically painting paint, it's uh, plaster, clay, and then acrylic paint. Uh, so, I think yeah. of, with this one, if there's another view that you had, I think, or because it, uh, like my other works, um, they have multiple heads and mul multiple faces. So there's a side view. I don't think you have the side view where it also no, looks sorry. like it's turning around and it's like looking yeah. at you. And so there's uh, different eyes. And um, when I made this with um, also, uh, each time you use different materials, you have to sort of respond to like how fast you have to work. With plaster, you have to work quite fast. Otherwise it starts to dry and you know, so there were a lot of holes in there. And I like the idea of all these different eyes and, um, but I covered up a lot of them. But then with the gigantic gaping sort of uh, bashed in head, which also becomes like a mouth or an eye, all these things, uh, it, it started to, it's, it's nice and mysterious because from the front, it looks like this um, sort of happy monster, you know, and then yeah. suddenly you turn around and there's something completely yes. different. But even in the other one that's in the show, there is a, you know, big hole in the back of the head. You know? Yeah, so it's, it's great. Um, let's just go, let's go upstairs so, and I'll turn over to Amanda to wrap up with receiver, but I just like, this juxtaposition between the view on the second floor uh, you were speaking about before, this is where all the bronze, heavier bronze works are concentrated on the second floor. And then this view, which I always show in my uh, survey class of the Lagache Gallery in the Louvre with all of these objects that were sourced by French archeologists, part of their colonialist expansion in the, uh, from the ancient Middle East, from the late Sumerian, period and Lagash and all these sculptures of Gadea, Gadea, who is name has come down to us because the, all these works were made in these incredibly hard diorite stone and basalt, et cetera. And there's a great one at the Met as well. I just thought Gadea would be a good name for a cat. But um, this gallery where 
you know, those ideas of empire and the idea of, um, you know, what we're talking about persistence and, and um, posterity um, that Gadea will never go out of cultural memory because these works are so strong and because of his great works. And then you go in the Louvre and there is this, you know, this room full of these somewhat, some headless statues of this figure on, on plinths um, encased in the seat of the, you know, the former French empire. I feel like there's something like that going on in these wonderful installations at Salon 94. That's very nice. <laughs> there it is. Go ahead, Amanda. This is the, this is the uh, key room upstairs. It's very beautiful, uh, kind of like a ballroom with this figure who's called yes. Receiver from 2019. Which is made out of bronze, and which I believe is in an addition. Who am I? There's yes, an addition the for these. All the bronzes are an addition. Okay, okay, and then these great uh, works on the walls, which are uh, large scale again collages. Yes, they are photographs that uh, I take. So um, I, I I use film, and I just uh, take snapshots and. Uh, Whichever ones I like, I have them enlarged. Uh, so they have a glossy, uh, you know, surface like a photograph does and uh, with a white border usually. Hmm. This is the largest I can go with the, we're using 35 millimeter. Right. And then uh, so, uh, the one on the right is a black and white, white photo. The photos are, are just, uh, you know, basically, as I mentioned before, sometimes they're landscape, sometimes they're, um, I mean, I can give you an example, like the one on the right is a, is a close up of a corrugated asbestos sheet huh. and with sunlight on it, you know. So just those kind of uh, moments when you see something really nice and it's a very formal decision that I'll photograph that, you know. So, and I, um, in these four, I have used uh, um, collage for to Oops, sort of sorry. make, it, you know, for the eyes, for the lips, and those are also photographic paper, which I um, have glued onto it. Huh. And so those are also large portraits. Yeah, they're really striking. Really and again, um, what was amazing was that I was actually going to install them downstairs and as soon as I put one up I was like no this like the room looks not you know it looks too busy so they had to be removed but um, the room upstairs which is the one with the checkered floor and the marble detailing and everything that room uh, is can absorb as much uh, information and objects you want to put in it so that's why the four um, drawings and two sculptures don't make it look um, too busy along with the floor and everything. So, mm. Mm. and just uh, a couple more views, a couple more views of the main sculpture. So this is like you know my um, receiver because he's a receiver is you know holding his holding its hands and almost greeting you and it has this sort of uh, archaic smile on its face. Uh, I was thinking about it earlier, and it's sort of like a, it remind uh, the smile also relates to the earlier sculpture you showed. We come in peace, which uh, mm -hmm. is like sort of like an evil clown. And um, I was thinking of you know that band, Insane Clown Posse, how they used to paint their faces. And yeah. I mean, uh, a lot of these, you know, these are the kind of things that sometimes you. They're in your head somewhere, and so they come out when you're so. And then it also has two eyes in the back. Um, yeah. Huh. Do you do you do these in two pieces and then cast them separately, or are they a single cast? No, uh, I always make everything to scale. So mm -hmm. the original, uh, made out of cork and styrofoam, is exactly the same size, and. Uh, Everything is one piece and uh, the foundry, uh, because it, ha uh, if, if I can give you some technical information, the, the two legs yeah, are separated please. there, you can see through them. Uh, so when you do things like that, um, they have to actually chop the sculpture up. 
Otherwise, it, they can't get that space between the legs. Huh. And then, you know, and you can always join it back together. Yeah. It looks like it's striding a little bit. Yes. Um, I, you know. I, yeah, it has a left foot forward, very, uh, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it has a Egyptian uh, ancestry. Yeah. Yeah. Or like a chorus, which one yes, person or wrote a chorus, in the chat. Yes. The Metropolitan Chorus at the Met has the one foot forward, but with locked knees. So the, per the figure's not really moving. Yeah. Well, that is a, a you know, uh, a lot of my standing sculptures, uh, starting with the original clay and uh, found objects, um, they have that sort of combination of uh, the chorus and the Frankenstein monster. So, yeah, the uh, bolts and things, yes. things. And all these things, and the more, you know, like for earlier on, I realized that, you know, uh, my interest in science fiction and horror sort of allowed me to uh, be much more creative with the variety of my imagery, you know. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. um, so I can do, you know, I have a lot of different uh, ways of approaching the work. As a kind of mashup of elements from all different periods and cultures. Yeah, and also because uh, using that as a source because they also look at the same things. So, right. uh, I mean, when I think about sculptures like Receiver or We Come in Peace, you know, I'm thinking about, uh, as you had, you know, there's the, there's the uh, gigantic statue of Coatlicu in Mexico City, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the stone sculpture, or, or Balzac by Rodin, uh, mm -hmm. or Predator, um, or, you know, movies like Gods of Egypt, where they play yeah. with scale, you know, and yeah, yeah. Um, I find those kind of inspiring to sort of, you know, figure out my problems. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, I, uh, my work is, you know, as, as I've been mentioning, you know, it's, it's very formal and it's more visually oriented, not idea based. And I and I think there's a slow release of information. Yeah. Yes, this one is uh, also a new. Uh, well, you saw the two pieces that were in the Bronx Museum installation, yeah. uh, which go on the wall, and so this is the third one uh, in that sort of uh, way, and this one is called I Know, which is so it's half architectural, half sculptural, and. Um, it was my yeah. It, it these pieces I call them uh, relief pieces. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it has the extraordinary, extraordinary, extraordinary elements so of the arms crossed over yeah, the yeah, chest, sort of like a votive praying position. Yeah, or like the woman of Willendorf and those uh, yes. the Paleolithic sculptures where their arms are resting on top of their quite often quite large breasts and possibly symbolic of fecundity, but that is a very particular pose with those really slender, thin arms instead of sort of cartoonishly muscular arms. And then these big, powerful legs and thighs. Mm -hmm. um, and this, the material here is latex or rubber, the pink. This is a remnant from uh, a mold from a bronze. So okay. when the All foundry right. is done with, uh, you know, if, if the addition is complete, then they like to sort of get rid of everything. And I like to take everything, so. And uh, <laughs> you never know. I mean, I, I have used you never know. Uh, these uh, latex. So this was uh, a section of something. They give, it's all in pieces, so. Mm. I, it felt like a head. It felt like a head, it also, and it's interesting that it feels like a veil, you know, yeah, uh, that you're covering right. your face and suddenly with you know everybody wearing masks and so the idea of wearing a veil is normal now you know so right um, that's true i thought that and it also because when you look at it, it in the back of it it's almost like two profiles looking at each other but you can't mm -hmm. see the actual break and then there's the one head in the front so it was a way of uh, giving it three heads you know right I want to come back to the second but just this detail here with uh, what seems like knees did you draw that in the gallery because it feels like it fits so well with the curvature of the niche behind it i noticed that when i was there 
No, that was drawn um, very earlier on when I was huh. mapping out the uh, figure on the you know, block of cork. Uh, yeah. And that is just, a, it's by chance. All right, it just fits in there so wonderfully. Yes. And here is a detail of this of the central section. You can see the cork um, and the massings. Uh, you know, and it's extraordinary to see this work. I know across the room from the big, uh, the big, um, the big bronze one. And in fact, they have an equal sense of, you know, monumental solidity, um, despite the incredibly variant materials. So. Um, yeah, that's a little bit of an intro to what you're seeing in, at Salon 94 and what um, Huma has been up to recently, which is a lot, a lot and impressively. Um, so I encourage everyone to go get up to the Bronx Museum of the Arts. Uh, New York is open, uh, uh, open for business. Um, and please come up to Salon 94 and see the works and Petzl to see, uh, I think it's work on paper at that show. Uh, flat no, work there, in that there show. are two sculptures and one. Oh, are there? Yes. Uh, I haven't been over there Very, yet. Very uh, beautifully installed Street. by uh, the director or uh, partner who has who's curated the show. Excellent. The whole show is very uh, well installed. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you so much. And thank you on behalf of Amanda, who had to catch a flight. So she sends her thank regrets. Thank you very much for having me. Out. And Oh, it's a pleasure. It's so wonderful to hear you talk about your work and, and uh, so interestingly and to see how you're continuing to experiment and do new things, um, you know, in sculpture, in a, in a, in a figurative, re figurative realm, but in the realm of the imagination. So thank you so much, Huma. It's been wonderful. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you. I turn it over to Malvika. Thank you, Jason. Uh, thank you, Huma. Um, this has been incredible. We have a number of questions that have come in from the audience. So hopefully we'll be able to hit uh, many of them. Uh, our first will come from Austin Taylor. And Austin, you should be able to turn on your microphone now. Uh, hi. Hi. Uh, I was, uh, yeah, I was wondering about like, you kind of answered it when you talked about Amy Goodman. Um, but if people have written like, or if you've written like biographies on each of the pieces and like particular like, what they're channeling as individuals. So I, I'm sorry, I don't, have I written biographies? Yeah, or if people like written about your work as like, like kind of like channeling the spirit of each piece. Um, I, I don't think so. I'm not, I, I don't, I'm not sure about that. If uh, they have written about each piece in that way. Um, I mean, I only answered that question. Normally I would just leave it uh, mysterious, but uh, ah. uh, it was only because Amanda asked, uh, because she used to be called Amy. <laughs> so she thought, uh, I mean, the, the, I haven't written any biographies. Wait, is Amy the only uh, per person of note that a sculpt that you've um, specifically made a sculpture of? Uh, she's my hero too. I'm, I'm so happy that you made that. <laughs> I, I can't think of, uh, I mean, I, I'm thinking about different people sometimes, you know, so I just happened to, this one just seemed like it should be titled Amy, you know, <laughs> but I, uh, I think of different people, but I'm not necessarily, uh, you know, making a form in their sort of likeness or something, or, you know, it's, it's not so related. Thank you for that answer. Uh, and thank you, Austin, for that question. Our next question in the interest of time will come from Tom McGlynn. And Tom, you can turn on your microphone whenever you'd like. Oh, <clears throat> thank Hi. you. Thank you, Malvika. Hi, um, this has been wonderful. Uh, great questions, uh, Jason. And I love your frank uh, description of your process, uh, Huma. So thank you. Um, I had a question about, uh, you mentioned like the box, the boxed in aspect of um, the Hittite sculptures. And when I first encountered your sculptures, I, I noticed that there's this kind of insistent planarity that it, it feels like, and you know, it's interesting that you mentioned the bandsaw too, because it, it looks like 
there like a bandsaw like just cut it off at certain angles so there's like this insistent planarity and then on the planes there's a, a, a graphic insistence too so it's it's interesting how you're combining two dimensions and three dimensions it, it seems very kind of uh, transgressive um yes I, i'm glad you think so <laughs> uh, i mean uh, i uh, you know with the cork sculptures they come as block i mean i glue them into blocks so with the idea of carving them out and so i think that's why um, and I don't, I'm not necessarily interested in um, realism, you know, so um, sometimes when they're left uh, plain and then uh, I can draw on them, I mean, they, uh, I can sort of, I like the freedom to be able to uh, create an illusion uh, through drawing on the sculpture and then also at the same time, um, you know, carving areas out or, you know, doing those kind of actions on them. Um, and, and, you know, because of looking at a lot of uh, ancient sculpture, contemporary sculpture, so you get different ideas as to how, um, what, what, what I can do or what I'm able to do, you know, so. Yeah, it's also interesting how sometimes you paint them, uh, like in a bisect, you bisect the whole thing laterally, almost like uh, 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 indigenous American tribes like would do with their war paint, like they kind of cut, cut off their face with like war paint on the top or on the bottom. So that also kind of transgresses the kind of uh, the expectation of a three dimensional sculpture, you know. Um, and uh, a lot of, I mean, that actually happened my using my use of like styrofoam with the cork was an accident and a lot of the decisions were either okay i'll just try this out and see what happens and it was also because i ran out of cork so i decided well i still want to make it a certain height and why not if i was doing it in the other sculptures and i could try it out in the totemic ones too and it actually is a you know, the colors are really vibrant. So they add another element to it, which is like this beautiful pink or green or blue or white, you know, so um, yeah. And, and I, you know, I, I thought that the result was good, but they're, they're usually, uh, resp I, I respond to the material a lot. Uh, and the dis a lot of decisions are made because of how easy it is for me to manipulate the material or not. So, and then uh, how much work I have to do around it to f for the end result that I'm looking for, you know. That's a beautiful response. Uh, thank you. Our next question will come from Ruben uh, Ulysses, who I think you may know. Oh, uh, but I will read their question on their behalf if that's all right. Uh, I just saw. So uh, Ruben's question is, hi, Uma. Uh, greetings from Juarez, Mexico. I'm curious if you still feel awkward and weird when you pick up the detritus from the places you see. Um, that Do you feel weird that you see it as found material? Also, has using non-traditional materials uh, made it harder for you to be taken seriously when you first began in uh, your art career? Uh, thank you so much. Uh, no, I don't feel awkward. Uh, <laughs> I, you know, pick up whatever I feel like picking up because you, you know, I think I recently did some pick up something. Um, and um, I think, you know, using found materials and uh, garbage and, uh, you know, stuff that people throw away, uh, that's, you know, that's normal, you know, it's like, I mean, uh, for assemblage and for collage, it's, it was always those kind of materials. Um, cheap, humble, uh, throwaway stuff, you know. And then, so um, I always did that. I, I did that a lot because of, uh, you know, uh, also because all that stuff is free. So you can, um, you don't have to buy it. And so you don't have money. So you make, you know, you use all kinds of um, 
whatever you can, you know. So, and then you try, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in the transformation of those materials or creating something that is transformative. So, and usually it has those kind. I mean, even using, uh, even cork uh, was something that um, I, I found uh, blocks of cork in a, um, in a, uh, what, what would you call it? A uh, card shop near my uh, ho house in Poughkeepsie. In my, I was living in this apartment building and this, uh, that kind of store doesn't exist now because you know, you don't go to buy envelopes. And so the guy was selling off everything and he had been using these blocks of cork wrapped with wrapping paper to, for his displays of uh, pens and in, the, in these vitrines that they used to have. Um, and when I saw them, I, and he said, yeah, you can have them for nothing, you know, so I, he gave me a lot of, enough cork for me to do some small sculptures and then I, I ran out, of, started to run out of it. That's when I introduced the styrofoam and that's when I had to sort of start looking for places to get more cork from. But it's not a material that, um, you know, a lot of people use and the com I'm also very interested in the combinations of materials. So styrofoam, cork, clay, uh, these are really great combinations. I mean, they open up a lot. Uh, there's a lot you can do. Mm, thank you, I love that so much. Um, it also makes me think, you know, working with these materials that you're, you work within a system or you work within an ecosystem that you're picking up sort of other people. Well, I mean, you know, I'm originally from a place where, um, you know, there's whatever garbage that is thrown out or even when you, we have people in India and Pakistan mm -hmm. that uh, will come to your house, they are recyclers and they will buy whatever junk you want for not very much, but uh, mainly newspapers, bottles, and then everything is resold. Even, um, you know, uh, even if you have some metal structure, you know, with bolts and screws and everything, everything is uh, disassembled sold by the weight so mm -hmm. you know it um so i'm gonna you know make sense to do that yeah. i mean i know i think it's a, i think it's interesting the way that sorry the way that you turn this detritus into something that has a kind of durable permanence that's a kind of magical thing we had a croatian croatian artist collective on a couple months ago i did a zoom with them tarwuk and they do the same thing that they, they they scavenge under the bqe and they turn it into these you, they, the extraordinary sci-fi inspired works. But I, I also love the way that you transform these things into something of permanence, i.e. bronze. Yeah, it's, a, it's a great gambit in sculpture, I would say. Well, there's a long history of it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I was just going to say, I know earlier we were talking about Corbusier, but you know, when I think about Corbusier, I think less about him and I think about his living legacy, right? In, in India, is um, in Chandigarh, that all of the materials that were left after the design of the city, the Corbusier chairs, the, all of this, right? That it was like all of these chairs for the city and for all the government buildings that are, you know, were designed for when they were down, that, they're, that they belong to the people, that they'll be used for mm -hmm. building new materials, building new things, and then at least for firewood. Um, so partially I'm thinking about that, but also I'm thinking there's really like a, it just makes me think of like Jugard, right? Like you have a really solid, like the spunkiness of MacGyvering new old materials into new materials. Mm -hmm. I will also say there's a question that's come in in a couple different MacGyver. forms. Yeah. Um, you MacGyver. MacGyver. Sorry, you said, you said MacGyvering, yes. Well, I said, it's a term that's been a MacGyver uh, reference. So I said, the first time I, I mean, yeah. I know MacGyver. Yeah, um, I said I said the word. I was teaching and, once, yeah. and uh, the student said, "You know, I just MacGyvered it." You know, so I said, "Oh, okay, I understand." You know, so <laughs> yeah, you were able to communicate. Yes. Yeah. Um, I feel like there's a question that's come in a couple different ways, uh, so I'll ask it one way. But um, this is a question of how you develop your work and how you relate to scale, um, both sort of in terms of the size of the sculptures that you're working in. But also I was wondering in terms of just size of workspace, right? Um, I know you used to work out of New York City and now you're up in Poughkeepsie where we can kind of see your beautiful fire, fireman's house. Um, but uh, I'm wondering like how does scale of workspace affect the way you make these works and also kind of scale in terms of material. You know, so many of the materials you work with, uh, you know, you bring up have a very long life, but we think of as kind of impermanent. 
Um, so I'm thinking styrofoam, cork, things like that. But then also you work in so many forms with materials like casting bronze sculptures that we think of as sort of traditionally very permanent. Um, so really wanted to ask you how you think about questions of scale. Well, um, I think that, you know, uh, I have always thought that, you know, um, I, you don't have to make work humongous or, you know, so large because the power, I mean, first of all, I wasn't uh, doing it. And secondly, it was like, if I can get that same uh, sort of response to the work, even if it's a small, you know, that's what I'm, the power of the work can be in whatever size it is, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be 20 feet by 20 feet or massive or, or be like a, you know, um, like, I mean, ancient sculpture is usually, you know, in a temple or a church, and it was supposed to be made to feel uh, for the for people to feel that power of um, you know and size was used. But I mean, I have all my sculptures. Uh, I think my largest sculptures were the ones on the roof, uh, and those are two pieces. Um, I made them in my studio at the uh, in Poughkeepsie to the scale because I am not used to. Um, I've seen 3D work, 3D printing done, you know, and, but I think uh, I wasn't able to sort of visualize things unless it's there in front of me. What, how would I respond uh, with my scale? Because that is the size of people that will be coming to see it. And, you know, does it, what kind of an effect that has. Uh, but I have worked in very tiny spaces. Like when I first moved to Poughkeepsie, my studio was the, closed in back porch of uh, this uh, sec bottom section of this house. I mean, it, it, I don't think it matters so much. It's more, you can make work everywhere, but of course, the more space you have, the bigger you can be more ambitious, you know? Um, the same with like, you know, when you have a larger space to show your work, you can also think on a different scale. But, that, but then for this show at Salon 94, I wanted to see how uh, a really large space like that could uh, uh, house, um, you know, domestic scale sculptures, you know, which would let then overpower it, you know. So um, I'm just, I'm, I'm interested in that kind of relationship. I don't thank know if that answers the question. I think it does. Uh, thank you so much. I think a related question will come next from Tricky Lopa. Uh, and Tricky, you should be able to turn on your microphone now. Um, but this also reminded Hi. me. Hi. Um, Hi. Go ahead. Hi, Huma. Hello. Thanks for this. Um, it's two in the morning where I am in Manila. And I'm so happy to, to be here because I saw your work in um, Art Basel Hong Kong last week. So I'm, I was very curious to learn more about you. I'm just wondering how big a team do you have working with you? Oh, it's, it's, I have uh, one assistant that I share oh. with my husband, who's a painter. And uh, I mean, I, I, I prefer to work by myself. So, you know, it's, uh, I don't work with other people on my work, uh, mainly just to sort of, you know, glue things together. Uh, sometimes the pedestals are, I mean, the pedestals are made by somebody else. I'm not a good carpenter. I can't make a straight cut. So, which you can see in the work. So, um, I, yeah, I, I don't work with uh, a team of assistants. It's just me. Wow. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I, this also reminded me, you know, so many of the images of your artwork, they come with, um, you know, when you look for an image of, of you as an artist, you'll see you kind of interacting with your artwork and like so much of, that photographic scale is like very interesting as well, but it's always your size of the body in relation to the size of the monument or the, the monster. Yes. Um, that is important. Yeah. And so, you know, to be able to use certain tools and to, um, I mean, if I, I have to be able to do it myself. Yeah, I love that very much. I think it's- Except very for the bronze, of course, I, I don't do that, so. Um, our next question is for, uh, from and for Noah Petrie. Um, but they asked that I read it on their behalf. And the question is, hi, Huma, thank you for doing this conversation. Uh, I wanted to ask you about world building and exploration in your work. 
Uh, I was hoping to, to kind of offer these words to you and pick your brain a bit. Um, do you see your statues as inhabiting a shared, certain, a certain shared space or world uh, which you explore and have encounters within, or do you see them as existing in completely separate worlds? Um, you know, I know you said a little earlier that you, the work you do is um, more formal and visual. It's not sort of idea based, so it's a slow release. But I'm wondering within the visual world, do you see it as like a world building? Yes, I, I mean, I, I would like to. I mean, that would be if it, if it uh, if it can sort of be accepted, you know, in that way. That's how I see it. Okay, brilliant. Our next question will come from Phyllis, and then I think we should be shortly wrapping up. Uh, but Phyllis, uh, you should be able to turn on your microphone now. Hi, Homa. Thank you for this. Uh, I hope you uh, know that when you read the David Smith review I wrote for the next Brooklyn Rail, it was heavily influenced by your show. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, but this is my basic question. You, you use color on the works on paper and you use color on the sculpture. Do you notice that you use color differently in each, in each field? Uh, to a certain extent because of, um... You know, the, I can use, when I'm making drawings, I can do all kinds of washes with different colors for the backgrounds and things, which I can't do on some of the sculptures. So there is a difference in that way. And also for, but within, with, with those two new sculptures that I did, which are painted uh, with acrylic, uh, those are now going to allow me a lot of freedom to uh, become a lot more colorful on the sculptures. With the cork, uh, I can, I, I think only like black looks good and, uh, and then I use oil stick on it because other, other material, other forms of paint don't, uh, I mean, I've used some white paint, but it's limited with like what will work, what won't work, you know, so. It depends, you know. Thanks. Thank you. There's a question from somebody. I can see them moving their arms around. Is it Joshua? <laughs> I don't know. Oh, yeah, one second. They're trying to ask a question. Here, Josh, here's your mic. Hey, Huma, how you doing? I'm okay, thanks. It's good to hear that. Thank you, Funk. Thank you, Brooklyn Rail, you know, for having me during this little segment. Um, Huma, thank you for what you're doing as far as, um, you know, recycling, um, you know, waste, setting a um, proactive stance in the world and in the art world through your artwork. So my question was, so since you had um, taxidermy experience, architectural experience influencing your work, um, also, um, with the firm experience in drawing to create your artworks, your pieces. I was wondering, my question was basically, will you go back to drawing instead of sculpting or will you use drawing completely as a platform to help you convey your message through your sculpture? That's all, thank you. I'll just continue to do both like I am right now. Um, I don't see any reason to do one only or the other. I mean, I, 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 I'll use both, both mediums to convey my message. I think that's yeah, they're definitely, it's definitely complementary the way that you work between the mediums. You can see that. And the way that they're displayed together is ideal, I think, to be able to look at them you know, in the same space in the gallery, so that's, it's, they're clearly equal parts of your practice. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I think in closing, we'll go to our last question that just came in from the chat, and this is from Karen Schifano. She asks, Huma, is there anyone in your life, anything in your life that you feel comfortable sharing that has given you the fearlessness and ferocity that comes to us in the work? I think I've, it's through my work I can share, you know, 
a lot. Um, I, I think that's the best thing that I am able to do, you know, and I don't think I can put things into words as well as I can, um, you know, two and three dimensionally. So uh, I'm happy I can do that, you know. So I, uh, I think, um, you know, something is getting across. <laughs> So otherwise I wouldn't be doing this interview. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, uh, if you're asking, they're asking like, what would I like to share? Um, they're asking, um, you know, what has given you kind of the fearlessness and the strength and the panache that we see so clearly in the work? Like, are there things- I think it's my, uh, I have a very uh, strong uh, relationship with my husband. And he's also an artist uh, and his name is Jason Fox. And I think that uh, it's, uh, it's important to be able to share and also critique each other. And um, it's a permanent sort of, you know, uh, you're constantly learning. <laughs> so that gives you a lot of, you know, and if we like each other's work, then we give each other confidence, which is something that you need, you know, otherwise, it's very difficult. I think that's a beautiful place uh, to start wrapping up. But uh, thank you so much, Huma. Thank you, Amanda, in absentia, and Jason for this incredible conversation. Um, as you know, thank you, I, yeah, thank of you for all of you uh, to listen to our conversation. Yeah, we're so excited. Um, so here at the Rail, we have a tradition we close with poetry. And today I'm so honored to welcome the fantastic Daisy Atterbury to the Zoom stage. Uh, Daisy has written for BOM, Post 45, and the Journal for Interactive Technology and Pedagogy. Um, they're the recipient. One minute, let me find Daisy. Let's see. All right, now we can all... Hi, Daisy. Um, Hi. Adder... Daisy has written for BOM, Post 45, and the Journal for Interactive Tech and Pedagogy. They're the recipient of a Mellon Fellowship in Public Humanities, as well as a Fellowship in Archival Research from the Lost and Found. Uh, CUNY Poetics Document Initiative, a curator for the Living Room series of virtual live poetry, so close to what we do here as well at CCA uh, Santa Fe. Atterbury is finishing their PhD at SUNY at CUNY Grad Center. Uh, Daisy, take it away. Hi, everyone. <laughs> uh, thanks so much. Uh, this was a really exciting curation, and uh, I'm honored to be part of it. Uh, thank you, Huma. I'm going to be reading from uh, my book in progress called Orbital Economy. And as I was selecting works for this uh, concluding reading, I tried to sit with uh, images of the three-dimensional pieces, uh, especially, and to feel into a kind of absorptive process. Uh, so I hope some of that comes through. and. Um, Thanks everyone for being here. A girl walks into a bar full of promise. We have to present ourselves in real and imagined autobiography. When you find yourself amplifying fantasy like a cherry, like you were so hard the Karman line is the international boundary between the earth and space. Due to inconsistencies in the earth's atmosphere, this border is approximate. It marks the end of national boundaries and the beginning of what is known as free space. I'm looking at a photograph of space company headquarters. I see a little girl at seven years old. She wears twisted pigtails, blue Nikes and a space suit fitted just for her. I'm in bed pondering lonely questions. What does the poetic form make available that's not available by other means? I ask you silently without words. The Carmen line describes the limits of human capacity for airborne activity inscribed upon an idea of atmospheric thinning this limit is changing quickly as our means of access to the outer layers of the atmosphere and space alter faster than I can write, 
faster than I can pace out this long wail. The Carmen line circumscribes the simply global orientation that has been a limit on human activity, if not on the imaginary. It's an asymptotal curb on fantasies of its perforation. We hold the border hard, fantasizing about what it looks, feels, and tastes like to cross. We don't ask for consent for there's seemingly no one to ask. We don't negotiate terms because we invented this language. I note what's been named, defined, and militarized, what reassures in its delineation of national boundaries, fictions that for the moment make nation states seem an inevitability. The leaves are quivering outside. I know fewer trees in New York City than I ever did where I grew up. Is that what signals home where you know the trees? Cottonwood trees I associate with watering holes and tire swings gleaming with wet skin and a queer loneliness, invasive species. I think about how and whether you can love a wrong tree, an invasive tree, its luxuriating spread, a reminder of seeds scattered without attention to the disorder the land wanted, how it's our problem now to love. We want it all so relatable that yes, I wanted a filling a living room or shopping at Smith's, the way void is an absent of yearning, the way frozen food holds potential, the way paranoid thoughts might still substantiate, they said, come align yourself with splinters, come be inlaid, my irritant, my pain in the ass life, my bad brief stint of lingering outside your driveway, wanting you in a wig, wanting you on stilts, in someone else's automatic drive truck or on your porch in a different season, a little colder, a little wetter, a little unlike whatever has been good for me. I look up wanting for, the term that uses me in the sense of lack, mid 1600s in most early languages, including Norse. I'm not without withouts, but not without bearings. I'm not entirely sure what lapse means in the context of water dripped all over your floor in the mornings, drinking coffee dripping, pressing a space bar dripping, this winter long and full of capital S secrets little bows over silences, hot poppers in a driveway, all to myself, or things that if spoken would mire us all in action. And I'll finish with this last piece called After Star Death. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, it's been really great to be here and to hear this amazing conversation after Star Death. In 1768, the captain James Cook sailed towards the Pacific islands of Tahiti and Australia. And if I had to describe a spaceport, I'd say it's a wishing well. I'd guess at your departure. A spaceport is a transit site of cashmere white granite bathrooms with a line, then you leave the earth. There's a debate as to the exact colonial contrivance that caused the Captain James Cook to sail his bottomless. Some scholars say it was the desire to observe the transit of Venus across the face of the sun. Was it the transit of Venus threaded that white hot granite with desire for mastery of the thing? Look. The dry ocean bed has stories it could tell in a hundred thousand lines out of order. The ship was called the good ship Endeavor, intended to find a southern continent mapping space. 
I have seen your locked lips and come home sweating. I write on my wall to see if you'll notice waiting in interstitial spaces, being dragged into this story, I said, a slice of blue in any distance is a dawn. I can feel the rain holding me in a captivity I truly wanted in this house to read and think. It's a rainy day fund we're using here, but we're starting to develop a poetics of, and did you want to join me for dinner, back channeling, did you want to pay for this now? Our assembly of the dissimilar, now a grave at the poetry project I read, effaced from her meek brow all lines of sickness, grief, and care, what we left as we moved across the sky. It. Thank you so much. That was beautiful. Thank you. Uh, that was incredible. Thank you so much for coming and uh, populating the space like that. Um, thank you so much, Huma. Thank you, Amanda and Jason, for this incredible conversation, uh, for opening up the space so beautifully and sharing so many insights. Uh, just want to mention that Huma's show, Facing Giants, is on view at Salon 94 through uh, June 26th. And she has several works also on view at the Bronx Museum of the Arts through September 12th. So go check those. So go check those out. So sorry. Um, as always, we'll share the video recording of this conversation on YouTube and our events archives online. So we'll be available later on if you wish to revisit this magical space. And please join us again t on Tuesday when we're joined by artist Sanya Kantorovsky in conversation with Ansi Collins and Ben Clifford. Uh, that'll close with a poetry reading and we'll be, as always, at 1 p.m. right here in the Zoom. Other than that, thank you all so much and I'll invite you to turn on your microphones if you'd like to say hello to each other, goodbye on your way out, uh, any thank yous, um, anything at all. But thank you all so much. This has been truly very special. Thank you, Huma. Thank you, Huma. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you Daisy. Thank you. Thank you, Daisy. 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 It was wonderful. Thank you. Have a good weekend, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. It was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great weekend. Thank you, Nick. Thank you. Have a beautiful long weekend. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Amanda. Hey, Yeah. Hey, Fong. What's up, Fong? Hello. Where I can't visit.